The next thing then is reconstructing slip history. So the idea is that once you maybe map the fault zone, then you'd want to figure out what happened along it. And this is an area we spent a lot of time on in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, so the main thing is, you know, measuring offset. It, it, uh, you know, the, the, basically the slip vector is the vector that connects the two previously continuous geomorphic elements, usually. Yes, geomorphic elements. So here is a view from uh, El Mayor Kukupa historic rupture where we have that slip vector and it has components of vertical and horizontal. Uh, here's the geomorphology. So this channel comes in and it has been offset. Um, and so here I'm kind of going to my point about the geomorphic displacements. There's been some geomorphic modifications to this that makes this maybe a little bit ambiguous with exactly how to reconstruct it. Then you might have some fault normal sort of trenching to get at some dip slip vector, or you might do some uh, trenching like this to sort of pick off a channel element that is continuous here across the, that little fault. So that's what we're trying to measure. Uh, one of the first uh, times this was done with LIDAR was uh, for the Hector Mine earthquake. And so this is an important paper that I always have to remind myself to make sure I'm citing whenever I'm doing some of this fault zone LIDAR because it's really one the, the first one that was published on this. So this was um, Hudnet et al. 2002. And I put it in the reading list. And it was, it, it's really important to throw some respect to it because they were kind of ahead of their time. They saw the technology and the problem, which was how do we measure this topography along this rupture. So they flew, this was a helicopter-based laser scan along the rupture. And then they were even able to take sort of swaths on either side of the fault. So you know, the dark is one side of the fault parallel. The gray would be on the other side of the fault parallel. And sort of figure out, well, what does it take to slide these back together to have a matching profile. So it's even the mostly horizontal strike split. So this was was uh, first time this was done with LIDAR data, and uh, it's important to, to recognize. So then uh, we got into it a lot. So uh, and this is a typical workspace. So you see Barrett there. He's got a coffee system. He doesn't have an earphone in, uh, but. Uh, you know, sort of interacting virtually with the high-resolution topography. And this was uh, this is part of a tool that was built by Olaf Dilke. And so what we, we want to do is be able to identify the fault. That might be that light blue line. And then identify the elements of the landform of interest. So these would be the, the yellow line. So these are these pieces of this channel. And we're going to project them into the fault. But it's important, we don't have to project them perpendicular. We may have to project them obliquely to the fault. And then we want to compute that slip vector, the H. And so what we do then is along the red profile and the blue profile, we cut these topo profiles. So there's red, and then here's blue, and you can see this is a little bit exaggerated. The center line of the channel, the tall vague, is a little bit offset. Now here it's been slid back and shows a good match. So that's that match right there on top of this match. And so this is the goodness of fit. So it's kind of the difference between these two profiles. And as we slide this back, our fit improves. It gets better, 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 best, better, kind of worse, worse, worse. So this that's this pathway. Then we find the best fitting offset. And we can then use this kind of approach to backslip the topography so we can put this, in this case, hard to see the nine meter offset. We can pull this back and say, well, does it make sense kind of geomorphically? And it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see like this shaded hill slope here looks more continuous with that backslope back than it does there without it. And so the key thing I always want to keep in mind is we have this quantitative measure of the reconstructed form but we also want to kind of check does it make sense. And so what we end up doing also is saying, well, how far can we reconstruct it as far as a maximum offset or a minimum offset? And that's kind of the acceptable range as well as the, the mode where the best fit is. And that we then can convert to a probability saying that, you know, 99% of the probability of the offset is contained within this acceptable range of offset. 
and turn that into a little PDF and then process um, large amounts of these kind of offset measurements. So that's what's done. So here's a kind of a quick comparison. So we did a lot of this work. Uh, we have, there's like 4,000 offsets for California and uh, probably almost a thousand of them are geomorphic offsets now. Main San Andreas, San Jacinto, uh, Elsinore, and then also Garlock, and then um, Eastern California shear zone offsets. But here's just an example from Barrett's paper from 2012. And what he did was compare sort of field measurements with, with LIDAR derived measurements. And so in general, we're getting a good match, thank goodness, right? But there are some important deviations. So this comes to Kate's question, well, which one is your reference? Which one's like the truth? And I think it's actually hard to say because both approaches, field and LIDAR based or sort of virtual measurements have their advantages and they both have their disadvantages. So it's important to be aware of both of these. And we'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow afternoon. Once you have these data, you can plot them some way like this. So this would be distance along the fault versus the individual offset. So this would be one single measurement. And what we also do is we try to characterize their quality. So is this a poor reconstruction or a high quality reconstruction? So we have the, the offset measurement as well as this quality rating. So the offset and its uncertainty are shown by the error bars, but then the cut like the darkness of this is kind of indicating the, the quality. So the darker is the higher quality offset. And so then one thing we can do is when, if we assume this piece of this fault, which in this case is the Clark fault of the San Jacinto system, we assume it's relatively uniform behavior, we can sort of stack all these data up so we can add them all up and build what we call this cumulative offset probability plot. So we can see that there's actually a lot of signal sitting at about two to three meters in this data set. But you see a second small peak here at about six. Now we don't really see much after that. So one way that this is interpreted then is this supports an interpretation that the last uh, earthquake had about three meters of offset along here. And then maybe there's another one at six. But there's a lot that goes into that statement that what we're saying is we're assuming that, that um, well, what we see, maybe we should say, is that there, there are significant offset around three meters and, are, and some around six meters, we may infer that that's one earthquake and then the second earthquake. But what we challenge ourselves sometimes is, well, maybe there's a couple of little earthquakes in here and then one big one, and then maybe a couple more little earthquakes and a big one. So uh, we, we still struggle sometimes with the one-to-one -one relationship between the geomorphic offset and the earthquake record. And so here then is kind of a map-based view of that. So here's Barrett's interpretation. So he, you know, using additional information said, well, this is offset versus distance. So there was an early earthquake, this is like 1910. And then this was the prior earthquake on the San Jacinto. It's, these offsets are kind of separated from this group at six. And maybe there was even a, a third one back. And so this would support an interpretation of kind of characteristic slip that each time there's an earthquake has about the same amount of slip at a point along the fault. And so these kind of magnitude seven ish events are repeating, which is a really important constraint for earthquake behavior. And then sometimes you have these little guy kind of curve maybe at the end of this segment. So so that's kind of a classical approach for interpreting it. Here's one where it's just kind of a 2D stack. So it's like taking this uh, this thing and flipping it on its end so we can see multiple of these COPDs but windowed along the fault. So we're looking at sort of energy in the uh, offset strength. And so you see a really big kind of bold three meter peak there. But we, we can sort of retrieve that three meter offset grouping here. Number looks like we're retrieving a six meter one. But this is what we've been playing a lot is probably a sort of data handling for these offsets because the LIDAR, the high resolution part to let us measure lots of them. Like, you know, in the field, you might uh, measure a certain set with a lot of hard work, but we can measure, you know, multiples of that in, in the office. So any questions on, on this? this is kind of 
there's a couple of the Salzburg papers in that review, and then look for the Zilke papers. So Olaf is keeping a lot of energy into this work for his PhD. Can you use the most recent offset to infer that's the average earthquake that occurs on the fault? And then get out the from Walls and Coppersmith, or is that too much of an assumption to me? No, it, it might be too much of an assumption, but it's done quite often. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we tend to want, basically the idea is that it, um, we typically assume that landforms are developing, like in Southern California, on a decadal time scale. So El Nino, we get erosion. So we're producing lots of little gullies and, and features. And then the earthquakes recur on the sort of 100-year time scale. So we have, you know, many landforms, the sort of suite of them, they get offset in mass. And then a new group of them will develop. So we'll get new single offset, but then the ones who were offset before will off be offset again. So we get these sort of quantized grouping of offsets. And that's the kind of fundamental assumption that these represent the past individual slippery events. So then if it's three meters per event here, then you go into Wells and Howard Smith and you say, okay, that's 7.3 earthquake. You can check what you think you can consistent with the rush line. So let's just look a little bit then at, well, what if the erosion, oh, question. Um, you go, yeah, so how do you distinguish between the two groups with the, the red and the black? Is that second, kind of, I guess after the big cluster on the red line, how do you distinguish between the black and the red there? Good, good question, because you would say, well, they're so close. I mean, they're, some of them are within an error, so how do you associate, you know, this offset with the 1910 event or the penultimate? And this, Barrett worked on pretty, you know, very deliberately. And his argument was that you could tell, especially in the field, but even sometimes in the high resolution be that the, the young ones were sharper. So higher curvature, higher steepnesses, and they were instinctively different from, from these guys. So implying that this penultimate one, and then based on Hill's seismology that they know is probably, you know, uh, 100 or 200 years earlier. So that was our Good question. Other ones on offsets? We'll dig into this a lot more on you. So then understanding geomorphic response outputs. So here's the, let's say you have a lot of erosion at the same time as you have a lot of deformation. And so this is the story of the dragon's back where you might have a, a, a fault and then we can look at, well, what happens if we have sort of instantaneous rock uplift uh, distribution along the fault and it's cumulative effect. So the idea is we have some uplift zone that's sort of moving along the fault zone, so it leaves a record of total rock uplift. So this is kind of the, the total, this would be the temporal derivative of it. And so you could say this uplift zone moves through the rock, or you can move the rock through the uplift zone. So it's kind of a reference frame question. So this is the model that goes, so material moves along the fault through relatively stationary uplift zone, how does the landscape respond, what will the landscape tell us about the geometry of the uplift. So this is the dragon's back shown within one meter per pixel. This is in the Carrizo plain along the San Andreas Fault. And you can see this really spectacular geomorphology. Uh, you know, this is about 100 or so meters higher than the valley here. It's a couple hundred meters wide. And the whole length is about four kilometers. San Andreas is on the back side of the dragon stack, so this is one block relative to this block. And what you can see, kind of just, this is what I saw when I was in grad school, I was like, you know, it looks like something sort of systematic, right? Like, look at these tight, high drainage density here, very steep, and then as you go this direction, the drainage density decreases, the drainage is getting bigger, and also the whole thing diminishes in elevation, right? So that was the geomorphic observation. But then I went out and I mapped the geology of it. And so what I could see was that there was kind of the youngest material with this gold deposit. But then I would, I, there was a tan one. And as I went this direction, I kind of could see through the tan one to this kind of pinkish uh, unit, which got progressively exposed, sort of eroding down through the tan. And so what, what I worked on with this, and then George worked on it, and then we finally had this paper hilly and Aerosmith in 2008. What we could do was to, to take that mapping that sort of stacks. So we have gold uh, and then the, the, topog the sort of top of the stratigraphy to tan and then down to the 
to the tan to the top of that pink unit. And so we have we know it's over here. We assume it's constant thickness, so we can sort of push it back down in the ground over there. So then when we track it and we hang those contacts on the topography, we can sort of pull it up to basically show what we think is the total rock uplift along this zone. And so that it looks like the, the, the rocks are kind of uplifting here and also tilting away from the fault zone. So they get a maximum rock uplift of about 80 meters. <clears throat> and so the idea that we have then is that material kind of moves into what we think is kind of a stationary uplift zone. So you, know, you can sort of fix this uplift zone from this side of the fault. We move the material in and it starts lifting up as it's riding over some kind of a knuckle in the fault zone, lifts up, and then it just stays up there. It stops lifting up and it gets carried away. But as it goes this direction, then it gets eroded into all that sort of <laughs> potential energy, the, the relief is basically chewed into by the surface process. So can then start computing metrics like topographic uh, relief. So what's the height difference between the valley bottoms and the ridge top? And you can see that in this area here where we're uplifting everything, uh, the whole landscape lifts up. But then once we get in the middle here, the drainage is cut down faster than the hill slopes. And so we get this great sort of landscape relief. Then by the end here, the, the landscape relief diminishes as the hill slopes kind of catch up with the channels. And so we're using the high resolution topography to help us kind of work with this little landscape evolution experiment. And we call it the dragon's back because it looks like a dragon sort of coming out of the, the valley. So here's its back, and these are the ribs. So see if you like that or not. <laughs> One quick question. How did you define the, your shape? Uh, your polygon of your uplift zone. Well, this 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 here is actually the spatial derivative of this, so it's actually okay. calculated from from uh, this just change. The one thing though is there's time, and that that's a good point. What we assume is that the uplift zone is fixed, right? And so we know the slip rate, 35 millimeters a year from further up the fault, and so we assume that distance along here can be converted to time directly. And so that's a big assumption, but if you let that assumption hold, then as we move along here, you can sort of watch these particles move in and uplift, and then they stay up there. They don't slide. This is the total, so this is just the rate. So, um, so that's a big assumption. And, and the model is that there's some kind of protrusion on this side of the fault that this material is kind of riding over, and so it's fixed to that side, so the total slip is reasonable assumptions for the rate of motion of this material in and through that alpha zone. So then, in terms of a little bit more quantitative metrics, um, if you look at a channel, and this, this is a lesson about topographic metrics in general for drainages, is you can, you know, if you look at my hand, I can have, a, I can have it look like this, or I can have it sort of be much tighter. So this is a low curvature, and this would be a high curvature profile, or high concavity profile. And so that's like distance from the divide versus elevation. This would be concavity. And this is channel steepness. So you can fix the channel steepness. So I don't change the shape of my hand. I just make it look like this, or I make it look like that. It turns out it's been shown pretty well that the channel steepness will seems to co-vary with uplift rate. So the steeper the channel is, maybe the higher the rock uplift rate. So this is work was kind of pioneered by Kellen Whipple. Um, in our school and apply it to kind of orogenic scales, but it seems to work as well for spine scale like on the dragon's back. So you can kind of recast this distance from divide and elevation into contributing area and slope of a point in the channel. So you see here we have large drainage area here and low slopes. That's down here where we're a lot of contributing area but the channel's lower slope. As you go up the drainage, we go down in contributing area, but the channel gets steeper, right? So then when you do this in log log space, these two channels, A would look like here and B would be there, so that the concavity is kind of the slope of this line, whereas the channel steepness is the intersect. So what we'll tend to do is assume constant concavity and just look at how the channel steepness varies because we think it's a good index of upper rate. So we tested that in on the the dragon's back, and now I apologize because I flipped this around. So 
This is the, the young man, the up, this is the uplift zone, but just kind of in a, in a profile. So here's the cumulative rock uplift, those 80 meters of uplift. There's a derivative of it, the uplift rate. And here, just to answer your question, here's distance along the, the dragon back, but then here's the conversion to time. So the dragon back 120,000 years old. And here you can see that indeed it looks like the channel steepness is higher where the rock uplift rate is higher. And the concavity is kind of all over the place, but um, and it seems to really change more as we see drainage integration occur kind of in the middle of the dragon effects. We start off with small channels here and they're not very deep. And as we go this direction, they get deeper and they also start to integrate. And so we get some kind of crazy concavities in there. But this is really nice because it's easy to calculate channel steepness in a landscape from digital elevation models. It's hard to get time in geochronology. So this kind of a metric is only used to go sort of hunting through data to look at maybe relative rock uplift rates. So any questions on that? So that paper that Julia and Errolson is in the reading. So last thing. Um, so 3D topographic differencing. So just one comment. So one of the data sets that we really use a lot and really got us started in open topography and a lot of work that my students and I have done, so I pretty much a lot of what I've been showing, is from the B4 data set. So this, maybe most people have heard of it, but it's codenamed B4 as in prior to the next earthquake. So this was an investment, sort of a grand idea that came from Mike Beavis at Ohio State, Ken Hudnett at USGS, and a colleague at, at National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping and also UNAVCO to basically scan the whole southern San Andreas. So 600 kilometers of data um, on San Andreas and San Jacinto, with spectacular data waiting for the next earthquake. But there have been other earthquakes where we could do different things. So this was the El Mayor Kukuba earthquake, and uh, it occurred in 2002. This is now a published 2012 paper. Sorry, it occurred in 2010. And we, so Mike Oskin and I wrote a, a proposal to get data right after the earthquake. So we got this data set. But it turns out that the Mexican Cartographic Agency, so their acronym is they had been flying a laser scanner in the region prior to the earthquake. So the data were not very high quality because they flew it really high and they were still learning how to make everything work. But there were LIDAR data from before the earthquake. So then we did the LIDAR data after the earthquake and we could try to do some different things. So here's just from after the earthquake, these really pretty fault starts. So we're illuminating from here. So this was strike slip and also a lot of dips, a lot of vertical. And so here's just a pretty picture in the field. So we care about these kinds of fault scarps. And so here was what we did is we took those, those prior data and we subtracted them from the after data and they were registered pretty well, uh, just uh, kind of without any special registration. So we just subtracted them. So this color difference is the vertical ele the elevation change. And so what's really impressive, and in this part of the rupture, there was a lot of vertical signal. So this is kind of more of the normal component. And, and so you can see like along this fault trace, indeed, there's, there's a clear disruption in color. So the, the fault was doing its thing, offsetting. There's almost, also kind of a gradient away from the fault. So you can see warping as well as offset. So it's really spectacular. And so this profile here, XX prime, just shows really nicely these two faults, this Paso Inferior right here, and then also the Borrego fault. So we see the, the breaks that are the faults, but we also can see these dots are kind of swapped profile through this vertical difference data. We can see this warping. So you kind of got a sense that, that the blocks were not only were they being offset, but they were kind of flexed in this earthquake. So that was a really spectacular result that only really could we get from the topographic differencing because the geologists, we all could go and see a fault scarf, but it's really hard to see this kind of meter over thousand meter warpage in the field, but you can measure it. So this was one thing we did and, and the problem with it was that it was only the verticals, only the vertical differencing. So you see how See how this ridge line is 
red on one side, blue on the other. So that means that the ridge kind of moved, or you could think of it this way, that you know the ridge was here before the earthquake, and then after the earthquake it was not aligned. So when we subtract them, we get this kind of aspect difference. So the facing direction looks different because the ridge moved horizontally. So that's the problem, and that's where Ed will come in and talk about the full 3D differencing of these data. So any questions? Two. Yes. Do the ridges have come slumping or landsliding? Is that there, was, there was a lot observed and a lot of dust, you know, was produced, but we never have really looked that closely at the topographic difference for mass movements, but I've never really seen anything that uh, systematic. Because I do see stuff like that in UAV star with fabrics. I was curious. It, you know, we talked about it, but we never have, have done it. And uh, I think what would need to be done is to, to do the full 3D differencing and then look for systematic uh, mass movement. So you, you, don't, you see pretty good coherence. So most of the, the difference is just horizontal tectonic displacements. And the warping, is there any air that's produced that's making it look like warping, or is that... It, it could be, but you know, we're slicing across the, so the data, the scans, mostly the errors in the pre-event data, uh, and the, 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 the wavelength of those scans is longer than this, and it has a lot of noise in it, but I don't think that we could explain it with error, but I don't know, have you thought much about that, Ed? I would agree with your earlier point about the landsliding. It would be it would be short spatial scale, so the fact that the whole of those ridges are orange on one side and blue on the other, I think shows it's a registration. Well, it's a, a, a horizontal officer. Yeah, and you wonder, like, this little red spot, you know, is that, like, a little enhanced vertical difference because of mass movement there? But that's probably the wavelength that, that we might expect to smaller coastal Oh, and also just, just a trick point, there's a, a very recent paper that basically reproduces this result from differencing the post-event LIDAR with pre-event photography from satellite, um, stereo satellite photographs. So yeah. the pre-event LIDAR here is about the lowest, well, the lowest resolution LIDAR that you can, you'll ever see. Um, and actually at that resolution you could do similar Similarly, well with uh, stereo satellite photographs. Yeah, that's the genre. Yeah, yeah. Right. albeit that would only work in arid areas like uh, like this one. Yeah, and there is we we should mention that there is so Pleiades that the European Space Agency stereo and tri-stereo high-resolution optical satellite system that produces pretty high-quality PEMs and also has done some pretty nice image differencing and some topographic differencing for like the Baluchistan earthquake in Pakistan a couple of years ago. So there's important work coming out there that, that we have, won't talk about. I don't think maybe you will want to touch. Okay, so I'm finally done. So just as a summary, we have this, this LIDAR, high resolution topography providing this decimeter to centimeter global accurate measure of the surface. This meter scale is critical for the geomorphic processes. The main applications are those four I talked about, fault zone mapping, landscape reconstruction, um, kind of geomorphic response to tectonic uplift, and then this differencing. Looking ahead, you know, we're just getting more and more data. Now it's really a lot more about differencing in this four-dimensional part. There's challenges to sort of process all these data. So this uh, early wavelet at all, this is a spectral approach to looking at topography. So really metric-based approaches we're going to have to move into. And then putting this more in geoscience education. So we finally got some LIDAR into a geology textbook in the last year. But uh, that's the really way to go, right, is if you're learning geology, you should see LIDAR in there. But it still takes a while to get it into 